Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming here tonight. Without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to um, introduce a member of this society, a former student at Churchill College, and tonight's guest speaker, Viscount Moncton of Brenchley. Mr. President, sir, I'm going to give you the science of climate change and I'm going to give it to you from a perspective which you will not have seen in the media, you will not have heard it from politicians, you will not have seen it in reports of the scientists who um, have taken charge of this debate. I'm going to talk to you of those parts of the science which they don't want you to hear about. So you may be thinking, what right does a non-scientist, albeit a former political advisor to prime ministers, have to talk to us about the science of climate change? Well, I have as much right as Al Gore has. Um, he's no scientist, yet, like me, he made a movie about global warming, and it won an Oscar for Best Sci-Fi Comedy Horror. <laughs> Now, I'm not going to give you, as he did in that film, my opinion about climate change because it is as worthless as his. I confess at the outset I am not a scientist of any sort, still less a climate scientist. It would therefore be totally inappropriate of me to lecture you about what view I think you should take on this subject. I'm going to take the approach of Fox News. We report, you decide... I'm going to show you an enormous amount of information, real information overload, from the scientific journals, which will give you a different perspective on climate change, uh, because I don't want you simply to go on believing, if any of you do, in this new religion of climate change. Um, my task here tonight is to desmog this debate and allow you to see one or two aspects that have not yet been put in front of you. My approach has been very much one of inquiry and not of advocacy. I'm taking a scientific approach, rather as T.H. Huxley did, when he said, the improver of natural knowledge absolutely refuses to acknowledge authority as such. For him, scepticism is the highest of duties, blind faith, the one unpardonable sin. And the covenant which I propose to make to this house tonight is that I will be as sceptical of the non-conformists in this debate as I will with the conformists. 
It is not my job only to question those scientific papers that are put forward by one side. I'm going to try to give you what is a fair, reasonable and balanced look at this question, but it will slightly overemphasize, as you may think, the counter-consensual point of view simply by way of restoring balance in a debate where the counter-consensual view has not, until the kindness of this House, had a recent airing anywhere in the UK at all. Now, you may well become angry as this address unfolds. The reason why is that you'll be angry first at me, some of you, because I'll be revealing hard scientific evidence that will challenge just about every supposed fact that you've ever heard about global warming. So one-sided has the media presentation of this issue become that you may well, some of you, find what I have to say rather uncomfortable at first. <laughs> but then as my presentation unfolds, if you're intellectually honest, you will gradually become angry with the politicians, the movie makers, the school teachers and politicians who have at best been too lazy to give you the whole scientific truth and have at worst deliberately withheld the truth from you and distorted it beyond all reason or proportion. Now, I'm going to begin very briefly with what the climate change debate is not about. It's not about whether we can just freely pollute our beautiful planet without any care for our fellow creatures or for their future or our own. I'm not here to advocate uh, ruinous over-exploitation of the planet's resources. That is no part of my presentation at all. Secondly, the debate is not about whether we are adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere because we are. And thirdly, I'm not going to say anything to you about whether adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere is likely to increase temperature. Uh, on this side of the presentation, it is conceded that, of course, if you add a greenhouse gas to the natural greenhouse effect, then there will be some enhancement of temperature. So what the debate is about then, it's about whether we can trust the scientists the politicians, the media who are driving us towards an avowedly alarmist view of what might happen if the weather became just a little warmer. Every five years or so, the IPCC produces a major assessment report on climate change. The most recent was published early in 2007. Now, the first chairman of this intergovernmental panel on climate change was Sir John Horton, and he said... Unless we announce disasters, no one will listen. There, from the chairman of the organisation which is supposed to be giving us unprejudiced science on climate change, is a statement that unless we announce disasters, no one will listen. A statement that we are going to reserve the right to ourselves to exaggerate the science so that we can make people listen to us. And with that background, we have to look at what are the motives of an organisation like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The first thing is quite obvious. The IPCC is a corporation, albeit without the constraint of, of shareholders. Like any corporation, it has a vested interest in putting itself first and maintaining its own existence and enhancing its own status and accreting to itself as much profit as it can. This is a matter of simple, commercial, practical, political reality. Whenever you set up an organisation to address a particular problem, it will go on addressing that problem, whether or not the problem actually exists. Now, as an illustration of the bias that has crept in to the IPCC's proceedings, I'm going to go back to the 1995 report that the IPCC produced. And it produced three statements each of which, in one way or another, said that there isn't really any evidence, hard evidence, that said that we can attribute observed climate change to increase in greenhouse gases. Um, we'll have the first of those now. Uh, here it is. None of the studies cited above has shown clear evidence that we can attribute observed climate changes to the specific cause of increases in greenhouse gases. That was what the scientific draft said. The next one, no study to date has positively attributed all or part of the climate change observed to date to anthropogenic causes. The third one, any 